Great. Um, so thank you so much for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you all today. Um, this is, I'm a little bit intimidated because I'm not really a physicist, but I I'm definitely an admirer of, and the, I love the, the physical lens to biology. So this has been a great series to participate in too. So today I'll be talking a bit about the work I've done in the Dunn Lab during my postdoc on epithelial lumen stability. Um, and that, I've been thinking a bit about that in the sense of like, how do cells build negative space? So a lumen is just um, this negative space, it's a fluid filled opening that cells make. And so you can see them here in this kind of art form where you have um, cells here surrounding a lumen that's highlighted by these shapes. And so I've superimposed these lumens over um, an artwork by Salowit. And so, um, and one of the reasons I've chosen this is because Salowit was an artist that rather than make his own art, he would write these guidelines. And um, through these guidelines, anyone around the world could recreate his artwork. And so guidelines would be like, make 30 horizontal lines, make a square in the middle, make 40 vertical lines in the middle of that. And so these works are recreated all around the world. And um, just like Salowitz artwork, cells have their own guidelines. And but more amazingly, they don't have anyone like Saul LeWitt telling them what their guidelines are, but they're the architects of their own environment. Um, they collectively make these hollow openings. And so um, I've been really fascinated in understanding what are the principles that these cells use to build these hollow openings. And before I really get started, I really want to highlight this has been work that I've done in close collaboration with Vipul Vachranjani, uh, really, amazing um, MD-PhD student in the Dunn Lab. So um, lumens are ubiquitous throughout metazoan biology. We're, as humans, full of lumens. And even the most ancient, um, oldest evolutionary oldest animals, like these comb jellies, have a lumen. And so here they are. And they have the gut right through the middle that allows them to eat and um, secrete uh, waste. And in the big uh, as humans develop, the very first separation of embryonic and extraembryonic tissue is separated in fact by a lumen. So you can see this here in one of these. And this example of forming this lumen, the blastocyst is actually relatively violent. You can see it contracting and expanding, sometimes breaking the tissue itself. And in this case, growth of this lumen is generated by a constant accumulation of pressure. And so because of the prevalence of lumens, not just in early developmental biology in ancient animals, but throughout all of our physiology, like we're just kind of a series of tubes and lumens, um, people have studied, um, uh, people have studied how lumens form. And so to summarize this vast work, cells polarize to generate an apical surface that's distinct from their basal surface, indicated here in orange and gray, respectively. And these apical surfaces are molecularly distinct from their basal surfaces. And so these apical surfaces result in the tissue having a defined polarity, an inside, here indicated apical in orange, and an outside basal. And so this allows this lumen to um, these apical and basal surfaces so that the lumen can sort through waste and nutrients often. And so the canonical view, just like in those embryos I showed you, um, is that lumens may grow via osmotic pressure. And this growth would be governed by the Young-Laplace equation which dictates the pressure difference um, between the cells and the lumen is um, dictated by proportional to the surface tension and inversely proportional to the lumen radius. And so when lumens are very small, this, if the surface tension stays the same, this pressure would be much higher. And so, I was kind of curious um, if, um, if pressure alone were stabilizing these luminal shapes, then this would be, these shapes would be mostly spherical, kind of like a balloon. However, when I went looking at lumens throughout, um, throughout our own like, human biology, I found that lumens were actually quite often not spherical. So here, this is an image of the human proamniotic cavity, and you can see that it's quite squished. Um, the bile ducts of the liver, you can even see this cell kind of like pushing into the lumen and the Wolfian duct of the kidney. It's also kind of elongated and squished. And so I was interesting if, interested in understanding if other physical mechanisms contribute to lumen formation and stability, not just pressure. 
And so to study this, I wanted to use a very simple system. So these here are MDCK cells, Madden Darby canine kidney cells embedded in a recombinant extracellular matrix microgel. And what's amazing about these cells is that even though they were isolated from their Cocker Spaniel kidney about 60 years ago, um, they still polarize and form lumens. And so this is an image of um, cells in matrigel 48 hours after embedding them, and the apical surfaces are outlined in orange here, outlining the lumen. And so these are, cells are a great model because they use the same polarization mechanisms observed at play in the kidney, liver, and or their organogenesis. And so I wondered what lumen surfaces look like in this system. And so what you can see here are, these are um, cells that are expressing the actin marker life act RFP. And so here, this really dark black blob is the apical lumen surface. And these here are 3D projections. And what you can immediately realize in just these two examples is that lumens are not spherical in the system, but in fact can be quite irregular. And this plot here is one of lumen sphericity. So this is just a metric of how close the lumen shape is to that of a sphere, where one is a perfect sphere. And so what you can see here in these representative examples is that this one corresponding to this dot around here at 0.5 is actually kind of ellipsoidal. But over here, this kind of clover shaped one has a kind of, um, has a lower sphericity. And this one over here corresponding to this dot has kind of a higher sphericity. Um, and what you can see is that as lumens get larger, uh, they tended towards these more regular spherical shapes, suggesting that as lumens get larger, maybe they are regularized by pressure, but something different is happening when they're very small. And what you can appreciate even in these examples is that um, they're, the surfaces of these lumens are bulging into the lumen, suggesting that they're not just completely propped open by pressure. In fact, they're kind of concave. And you can see this more clearly if this, in this um, uh, movie that I'm about to show you, where we have a 3D contour plot of the mean curvature of the lumen surface, where convex is blue and concave is bulging into the lumen and is red. And so then we plotted the percent of these luminal surfaces that are concave or bulging in. And you can see that even as lumens get large, um, they still can have these concave surfaces. And so these, just looking at these luminal shapes, um, they're inconsistent with a model where positive luminal pressure is the sole driving mechanism. And then we noticed something else when we were looking at this, um, this, this uh, kind of clover shaped lumen, which is that there's just so much extra to our mind, um, apical surface to constrain the volume enclosed by this lumen. And so what we noticed is when we plotted the average um, the apical area per the number of cells, this was roughly constant, independent of how big the cell uh, of the lumen was or how many cells were surrounding the lumen. And so cells seemingly have a target apical area independent of how much um, volume they're enclosing. And so we thought that there were three possible physical factors that could influence lumen shape. First, luminal pressure, as I talked about. Second, cell cortical tension, and third, apical area. And so then we went about experimentally modulating each one of these and looking at the change in lumen shape. And so this is maybe the most kind of biologically heavy part of this, but what you need to know is that tight junctions are these complexes that seal tissues and they're essential for the barrier function of epithelia. And so they're composed of transmembrane proteins, clodins and occludins, um, and zo, and they link up to the actin cytoskeleton. And when you knock out um, these proteins, when you knock out clodins, you decrease um, this barrier function, the cells become leaky. And so um, what we were able to get our hands on, it's a generous gift from Tetsuo Otani and Mikio Frus's lab, were cells that were lacking in the clodin um, transmembrane proteins in MBCK cells. And so here you have an example of a wild type cell forming a lumen. And what was surprising to us is that even though these clodin quin knockout cells, which are supposed are 10 times leakier than their wild type counterparts, they still polarize and they form lumens. And so these are, they don't need to have the barrier function to form these lumens. And we looked at luminal shape by using a metric of solidity, which just measures um, how much difference is between uh, the convex hole and the, the, the area of the convex hole and the area of the lumen. 
and we plotted this as a metric of lumen size, and we found that there actually wasn't a significant difference in the shapes of these wild type lumens versus the shapes of these cloud and quin knockout, very leaky um, lumens. And so again, pressure alone is not a driver for determining lumen shape and stability. So then we went to test the influence of cortical tension on lumen shape. And so here I added a cytoskeletal drug cocktail with inhibitors of actin, myosin, and microtubules. And I've done these with different actin inhibitors, and I've done these in different combinations and alone. And um, much to my frustration, the result was the same, which is that even though you can see the actin signal depletes, there's still a lumen. And so this was really frustrating and surprising to me because uh, I kind of come from a world where actin and myosin should be driving everything in a cell shape and a cell process. And I was surprised to see that in fact, the lumen didn't care whether the actin, um, actin-myosin uh, network was abrogated. And so you can appreciate that in these 3D contour plots where I have the shape of the lumen two minutes before adding um, the cytoskeletal drug cocktail or vehicle control in blue, or 18 minutes after in green. And you can see that even in this control case, the CMSO vehicle, there's a little bit of wiggling of the lumen itself, but in the cytoskeletal drug cocktail, there's a little bit of change in lumen shape, but it neither collapses or completely explodes. And so this is a very subtle. And so this cortical tension factor isn't um, significantly influencing lumen shape or stability. And so then we wanted to influence test the influence of apical domain size on lumen shape. And so here, the apical domain is specified by a couple of complexes, the crumbs, crumbs complex and the par complex. And so the crumbs is one of these factors in this apical domain. And so it localizes to the apical sides of these cells. And when you overexpress crumbs, actually these apical faces bulge into the surface and get larger. And so, we thought that maybe just by increasing the apical domain size, you could change lumen shape. And then, um, and so this is work done in, in, in Ben Margulies' lab at Michigan. And we also found that by influencing the PAR complex by um, this Kibra is a negative inhibitor of APKC. And when you knock down Kibra, you actually also get this bulging in phenotype. Also, again, this negative inhibitor is resulting in um, an increase of the apical domain size and bulging in of the apical surface. And so this time when we plotted lumen shape versus um, this is lumen size, we actually found the shift. There's a marked like change in lumen shape. And so actually in our system of these MBCK cells, um, apical domain size has a significant effect on lumen shape. And so we hope to develop a model that could account for our measurements. And so we generated a 2T vertex model with parameters for luminal pressure, cortical tension and preferred apical domain. And so each cell in this N model spheroid was described by four boundaries um, here, a curved basal boundary, a lateral boundary, and this curved um, apical boundary. And this apical domain can have a preferred apical, um, apical domain size. And then they have um, cortical tension um, at the basal and lateral and apical boundaries. And, a, um, and this is modeled as springs. And so all of these boundaries have length that enclose a cell area A. And so the lumen shape is determined by all of these vertices and the curvatures of these boundaries. And so here is an output of the simulation um, of one simulation. And so it has a random initial configuration and it's minimizing energy configuration is generating apical domain and shrinking the space of lateral domain. And then the highest energy cell in the simulation divides and it goes through that same process again and again and so on to 10 cells. And so at each step, we can measure the lumen shape. And what we can do is we can um, modulate each of these parameters with respect to each other and look at how they affect each other and lumen shape. And so here I'm showing you the outputs of our simulation while varying luminal pressure, but fixing cortical tension and apical domain size. And what you can see is that in this model, increasing luminal pressure, which is going from orange to yellow, results in more regular shaped lumens, more solid lumens. You can also see this in this output, um, these representative simulation outputs here, where orange is zero pressure and yellow is, is um, high pressure and they have um, more uh, regular shapes as you increase pressure. And while very, here we varied cortical tension, but fixed luminal pressure, and um, apical domain size. 
And so in this case, we found that um, increasing cortical tension resulted in uh, more regular shaped lumens. And so this is, sorry, decreasing um, cortical tension resulted in more regular shaped lumens. So you can see this going from orange to green, where it's an increasing solidity or more regular shaped lumens and um, going here on these, these outputs from um, green to orange. Again, you have more regular shaped lumens. And finally, when we varied luminal, when we varied apical domain side, but fixed luminal pressure and cortical tension, we found that increasing apical domain size going from green to orange here resulted in more irregular shaped lumens or less solid. Um, and here you can see this again in these um, representative outputs of the simulation where you have more regular shaped lumens at this low apical domain size and very irregular shaped lumens at this high apical domain size. And so in this model, increasing apical domain size leads to more regular shaped lumens. And it's seemingly this lumen shape is more sensitive to apical domain size than changes in luminal pressure or cortical tension. But what's awesome about simulations and modeling is that you can kind of vary more, just, you don't have to constrain yourself to fixing these two and varying just one, but we can look at them um, we can look at varying apical domain size and luminal pressure at the same time. And so what I'm showing you here is the output of simulations at six cells with a constant cortical tension. And here, this is a metric of um, a mean of each of these conditions, the solidity, the mean solidity of each of these conditions, where blue is a high solidity or more regular shaped lumen, and red is um, a more irregular shaped lumen or low solidity. And on the x-axis, we're increasing preferred apical length, and on the y-axis, we're increasing luminal pressure. And so here, this is the highest um, solidity shape lumen that we got from these simulations. And so you can see that it's a very um, regular solid um, convex shape with high pressure. And then over here is the lowest solidity output that we got. And you can see that it's a very irregular um, shape, a very low regular, and it corresponds to having a very high apical, um, preferred apical domain size. And so what's really neat about this model is that lumen shape can be stabilized and regularized by pressure dependent mechanisms, just like I showed you in those embryos earlier on in my presentation, where high, high pressure can generate, can stabilize a lumen shape, and it can be stabilized by pressure e independent mechanisms that depend more on generating apical domain um, size. And so this sets a prediction where lumen can be stabilized by pressure dependent and pressure independent mechanisms. And so um, what we think is that we have an, another mechanism of, um, that drives the stabilization of, of lumens during the initial stages of lumen growth. And so you know, I started out this project thinking that I would be looking at the physics of lumen stability. And what I was confronted with is that it was really more biological, that cell biology, uh, the cell's biology itself had found a way to generate um, this nonstick apical domain. They expand apical domain by adding cells. And at a certain size threshold, they um, switch to this kind of pressure-driven growth mechanism in the system. And we find that this mechanism is robust and energy efficient. A back of the envelope calculation suggests that for small lumens, the free energy cost of pressure-driven expansion is in fact greater than that of expansion of, um, at low pressure via this kind of vesicle fusion mechanism. Um, and what's really neat is that the physical mechanisms of luminogenesis is the same mechanisms as that of defining an apical domain. And so these mechanisms, um, this means that the cell connects two tasks that they absolutely need to do, polarize, generate an apical domain, and make a lumen. And so they get two things for one. And what I find really fascinating is that this also coincides with this deep ancestral linkage of forming a hollow opening and the definition of an apical domain. And so what you can see here is that right when metazoans appear on the stage is right when they link up their, um, they're able to actually link up forming an apical domain and um, cell cell adhesion to form a lumen, just like in this comb jelly I showed you at the beginning of my talk. Um, and so I think this is really neat because we find a mechanism that um, cells generate apical domain, they form a lumen, and um, they kind of have get these two things for free. Um, and so with that, I think that's all I have for you all today. Um, this work is done um, in the Dunn Lab. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is done by 
close work with um, Vipple and uh, Carlos Garcon Corral built a lattice light sheet that got us some of these amazing images of the smaller lumens um, that have that really kind of broke the story open in understanding that there's so much of extra apical area in these small lumens. And of course, I have to thank Alex and um, the awesome environment it is to work in the Dunn Lab where I can kind of explore these fun projects. I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for that great presentation. There are several questions in the chat. So let's see how many we can get through. Um, Let's see, Kinjal asks, cortical tension seems to impact lumen shape. So why did suppressing actomyosin not have any effect? It, so it did, it did have an effect, um, it, but it didn't have as an effect as um, dramatic as I would have expected. Um, so like, I think my initial, when I first started this project, I thought that it would be done as soon as I hit it with like a, like, any sort of cytoskeleton inhibitor, um, thinking that like the actin cytoskeleton was kind of acting as a bridge. Um, and so kind of, you see all of this apical actin. And so if you got rid of it, then the lumen would kind of either collapse or ex explode. Um, and what I found is it's kind of more subtle than that. There's a subtle change in shape, but it's not, um, it's not very um, dramatic. And I should say that I was adding the cytoskeletal inhibitors at pretty, high um, concentrations. Um, and that experiment that I showed you was actually one out of frustration in which I just kind of tried to throw this kitchen sink at these lumens um, to see whether anything would affect them. Okay, I think that connects to, uh, to a follow-up question about the, the collapsing or exploding of the lumen. Um, question from John, can you clarify the physical meaning of luminal pressure? Originally, it was associated with Laplace pressure. Now the curvatures are reversed. And why And why should air inside be at a higher pressure or presumably whatever fluid is in there? Wouldn't cells be pulling away their boundaries from each other? Yeah, so I think, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, um, but maybe I can try to clarify. Uh, so the cells are pumping fluid into the luminal space. And so they're doing this with different um, channels and like ion channels. And so, um, yeah, so I think, I, I guess, I don't know why, I'm not sure I understand how to answer, wouldn't cells be pulling away their boundaries from each other, um, that clause. Um, I, I think the question I... might be related to um, to, to the curve. So the little plus pressure was with the curvature of the of the lumen, and then the, mm -hmm. the the pressure that you're talking about that's pumping pumping fluid in. I guess this is this is a different pressure from that one. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I guess what we're the idea being like, if the lumen is held open by pressure, like if there's higher pressure, exclusively pressure. If, if the lumen is held open exclusively by pressure or just like just by osmotic pressure where it's just kind of pumping up, then um, then anything we do to like make the barrier leakier or change the ability of um, these cells to pump ions or pump water should change the shape of the cells. And what we found is that instead they're, they're not. Um, and so um, that's, like that's one of the results. And then I guess with, with regards to the curvature, I think that's getting at like what we were initially thinking is that, okay, it's a combination of pressure, but then the reason that we have this kind of flopped um, curvature would be that maybe the, the, court, the, the cytoskeleton is imposing a preferred curvature. Does that kind of answer the? Yeah, I think Great, so. Thanks. Um, okay, we have another question from Matthew. Um, have you studied adhesion of the basolateral contacts? Does the increased uh, basolateral <laughs> domain play the opposite role of increased apical domain? So we haven't increased the basolateral domain. Um, that's been tricky. We, we've tried. Um, there are some like APKC inhibitors that um, I've tried and apparently they're just like very finicky. So I haven't had any luck in like, I can't tell if they work. Um, the other thing is that messing with apical basal polar uh, polarity, there's kind of a sweet spot. Like if I, um, 
if you overexpress crumbs too much, then you start shrinking the basal lateral domains and then the cells start going through like an EMT. And so the whole thing kind of goes to shit. Um, but we have actually um, messed with um, kind of knocking off coherence. And um, I don't know how to really incorporate this into the story, but I've done this in a couple of ways. One, so e-coherins are these transmembrane proteins that link up together. And um, there's a cell line where they're, um, you can knock off the extracellular domains. And somehow those cells actually still form lumens. Um, and we have uh, alpha catenin, which is the, uh, one of the components that links up these transmembrane e coherence to the actin cytoskeleton. We have um, knockout cells of these alpha catenin, um, um, knockout cells that are missing alpha catenin, and they also still form lumens. Um, and in that case, it looks like the apical domain is kind of also expanded. Um, so, um, I think that there's a bit of a compensation mechanism. There's other catenins that could be compensating and other coherence in both cases that could be compensating, but um, lumens are fairly robust, which has been, a, um, I think, something that's been amazing, but also frustrating about this project. So I have a follow-up question um, to that point, is when the lumen initially forms, so when you have cells that they need to create this negative space to begin with, are, are they moving around transmembrane proteins that some, that somehow just allows the the apical side to to just detach from each other and then and then fluid gets pumped in or how does the space initially get formed? Yeah, so um, I think so. There's there's some models that like oh that you can have like um, negatively charged proteins like um, like kind of glycocalyx like protocalyxin proteins. And that could, and those are exclusively at the apical side. And that, what I think that serves to do is actually make the apical domain non-stick. So you have these lateral domains of cells that are sticky with these coherence and different adhesion proteins and the apical domains, rather they're not necessarily repelling each other, but they're non-stick. And so then if you can continue to add packets of, of more apical area and a, at least a little bit of volume, then um, you kind of have the lumen. We think of it maybe as like a floppy, like a floppy bag full of water. Um, and so it's the those membranes aren't. It's not has a, a specific necessarily like a specific shape, but it's kind of just floating around. 